So my talk is about a project I'm working on called DAT. Uh, and DAT is kind of like if Git were built for data. And when I say data, I should really specify it and say tabular data and large data sets, real-time data sets. And um, you can learn more at datdata.com. So we're living in, it's, you know, it's 2013. Uh, Git and GitHub have now changed the way that programmers work together by enabling open and scalable collaboration. So this is so huge for me as a programmer coming up. I'm so glad I live in the Git and GitHub age because it means that I'm not just limited to the company that I work at and the people that I work with, but I can work with people around the world in a totally distributed fashion. So I'm part of you know, a giant global movement of people hacking on little solutions. Everybody can share their shared solutions together. Um, and so before Git, we kind of had this thing where the maintainer writes all the code. And if you want to send the maintainer some code, you have to email them. So there was this uh, really bad bottleneck where the maintainer would get overloaded, and then you couldn't even see what other people were sending in. So if two people implemented the same thing, there's a lot of duplicated work. What GitHub did is it put the code in the middle, made it totally public, and now everybody's a maintainer. The contributors have just as much access to the code as the maintainer does. So it really puts the onus on the maintainer, or it puts the onus on everyone to be a maintainer. And that's a super powerful idea. So imagine you have a scenario where you're a traffic monitoring agency. Maybe you're working for government, maybe you're a private entity, maybe it's just a nonprofit or a scientific research project, but you put traffic sensors on light poles. Every time a car drives by, it emits data. So there's data coming out of the, um, the sensors. And what you want to do is you want to take the data and feed it in um, and store it. So you want to have it in some sort of data version control. So um, the best tool we have for that uh, is Git right now. Um, and Git is designed for source code. But we can put data into it too. Imagine you just append a new line to the CSV every time a car drives by on any of your sensors. So you write a little program um, that takes the data from the sensor network and puts it into Git and makes a commit. So what happens over time is you end up your data grows and grows and grows, and this isn't even big data yet, um, but the data will accumulate, and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then if somebody else on your team wants to share that data, they'd have to clone it. And the problem with Git is that as soon as you clone it, there's already new data at the source, so you have to manually clone again. It's not designed as a real-time collaboration system. And that's unfortunate, because um, data, you want it to be up to date all the time, kind of like the Twitter Firehose API that all the developers love. And so, Every time you want to transform the, the data, say it comes out in a raw format, all the columns are eight letters wide instead of longer, they're all capitals, maybe it's in some sort of weird date format, um, you have to write custom code, one-off code, and everybody's written this. I myself have written custom importing code. Um, there's a, an industry called ETL, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which um, kind of addresses this problem in a really high-level way, but um, the idea of writing, you know, you can call them scrapers, you can call them import scripts, just something that takes data and puts it into the database of choice. Say you want to make a query in MySQL, you know it's going to do the right job. You need to write custom code that takes the data from, in this case, CSV in a, in a Git repo and dumps it into MySQL. You end up with one-off code. And that's a, that's a big problem also because if two programmers on the same team want to use different databases, they have to do twice as much work. And then eventually with Git, you end up hitting a point around a million commits where it just gets too big, you're writing data too fast, and it can't commit fast enough. So Git doesn't really work, it crashes, um, and you need something more scalable. So um, what I'm working on is called DAT, and it's a prototype um, funded by a foundation in the United States called the Knight Foundation, um, and they fund civic media projects. They are a major funder in Code for America. And I started working on DAT when I was in the city of Boston. I worked for the mayor's office, and I was working on fleet management software for uh, knowing where all the food trucks are, knowing where all the school buses are. So uh, what it is, it's, it's a, a streaming real-time table replicator is the simplest way to put it. So it's built with these technologies. Um, I'm using them because Node is one of the fastest growing ecosystems, and it's a distributed I.O. Um, platform for managing I.O. on different platforms and sending data around really fast. It also is built on LevelDB, which is um, built by Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gemawad at Google. They also wrote Bigtable and Spanner. Um, LevelDB is actually uh, the data like, for a single Bigtable tablet. It's the database. So it's a building block for a distributed system. And the NPM is um, the kind of sister to Node. NPM is the package manager, and now there's about 50,000 packages, many of which do streaming I.O. fast and can stream data from different computers. So the fundamental difference between Git and, say, DAT, um, and DAT is just my prototype of what I would like to see more tools of in the future, kind of like a pattern. Um, patches are to code what transforms are to data. So 
With code, you can send patches around, and every patch is written by a human. It's very rare, you have this sometimes, but it's very rare that you have a, a script or a program writing other programs or metaprogramming. Um, more often than not, most of the time, people are writing code because by hand, like artisanally and bespoke, because code is very difficult and it's very brittle. So if you change one, you put one semicolon in the wrong place and your entire program breaks. But if you put one semicolon in the wrong place in an Excel spreadsheet, just that row breaks or that cell breaks and the rest of the data is still parsable. So with data, you can, you can use transforms as your sort of stand-in for patches. Um, it's, it's also things like if you have a data set that comes in and then you, you just patch it, you have to write your, a transform that allows when new data comes in, it can patch the new stuff. So transforms can operate on streams of data, basically. Um, and there's another problem, which is that this is how my vision of how the open web works today. So at the top, we have a very small uh, minority of places that are coming up with the platform. They're designing and implementing the platform. In this case, places like the W3C or people that work on Chrome at Google or Firefox. And then at the bottom, we have people that use the web um, for business, for whatever, media agencies, consultings, everyone. Everybody here has made a website at, at some point, I'm sure. Uh, and in the middle is a very important critical piece that the web does a really good job at, um, at facilitating, which is people that take the implemented APIs that are difficult to use in most cases and make them palatable to normal people. So in the middle, we have tools like jQuery, Backbone.js, Node.js. These are just on the web. And the library authors in the middle, they have, uh, they're pretty well represented, I would say. It's a pretty healthy balance between these three um, stratified layers. And so in open data, we have the same stratification. Um, at the top, we have the implementers, AKA you know, the people that fly the satellites and collect the satellite imagery, or uh, government agencies that collect traffic data, or scientists doing research. And then they have their data in a, in a raw format. But then people that want to use those, say data journalists, researchers, hackers, open data civic hackers, um, they might not want to learn the NASA formats at a low level. They just want CSV or JSON or, or something nice. Or you know, they just want a SQL database to pop up and they can just play with it. Um, and in the middle, we have some tools. So we have specialized data tools like R. We have you know, a lot of open source data format parsers like CSV parsers. We have tools like NumPy for analyzing data. But in my opinion, um, we need to have better tools in the middle to bridge the gap between the top and the bottom uh, because there's, there's an imbalance here. And so um, in the example that I used previously, if we were to revisit uh, that with DAT, it would look something like you would collect data, you would put it into a DAT repository, and then DAT is designed from the outset to work with any size data. Just It's a limit of how much disk space you have. So you can put tons of data into it. It's built for large data sets. Um, and then this is where it gets exciting for me is that everyone can be synchronizing, um, almost like Dropbox style, but for spreadsheets. Everyone can synchronize from the DAT repository or have more distributed workflows that are more complex. But when you update data in one place, it syncs out to everyone else. That's my design goal. And then, um, but that's just the technology, which is rather boring. The most exciting thing is the community. So um, this is an example where, imagine you had raw data on one side. I say it's XML data, maybe uh, the example that I, like to use is every time Congress votes in the United States, it gets emitted in XML somewhere on a Congress website. Um, but that's kind of like a you know like an RSS feed or something. So if you want to have that and put that into a say a MySQL database to query to do some sort of story on what congressmen vote for different things, um, you might take the data and dump it into MySQL. But that requires you writing one of those custom pieces of code. If somebody wants to use that code to dump it into say Redis or Postgres, they have to rewrite all that code. So my goal with DAT is you put DAT in the middle and you write importers and exporters that are separate modular pieces of uh, functionality that can be shared. And another example of one of these modules would be something like a geocoder. So if you get data into DAT, then you can use a module that geocodes any data in DAT and adds latitude, longitude columns. Um, so somebody could write a DAT XML importer module and share it with everyone else that's a DAT user. The cool thing about this is the first person that writes the XML importer is the last person that has to write the XML porter, importer because it will have an associated GitHub account or a GitHub repository. If somebody comes along and they're like, oh, I need it to have this feature, they can just send a pull request. Um, you know, you're obviously going to get some duplication, but my goal is to um, take the data import workflows, the things that people write, people that are munging data, those scripts, and let them publish them and have other people depend on them to kind of have the same network effects that you get with open source. Um, so the ultimate goal, the secret ultimate goal, is I want to enable a vibrant ecosystem of reusable modules, because that is how open source communities scale. Um, but they haven't quite hit data. You know, there's so many verticals between, oh, I use Python and I analyze scientific data, or I use 
um, like Node and I analyze real-time data, or I use Hadoop and I can't even tell you about the data that I, I analyze. Um, so basically, there's a beta release coming soon um, at dat-data, um, and it's being developed completely in the open. Um, I would encourage you to get involved in um, give me your feedback and your use cases, uh, because uh, I would love to see what formats people want to work with. Uh, the last talk I absolutely loved about um, analyzing how people use spreadsheets. It would be awesome if we could write an uh, Excel macro analyzer plugin to free data from Excel that uses macros. Um, that would be super cool. Um, and you can contribute at the uh, GitHub account, of course. There's an issues page. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>